he is the stone which is rejected by you. And if you're unholy and you haven't accepted Christ, you are rejecting that stone that you need. You're rejecting him. Welcome to Unleashing the Truth, where the power of God's Word is unleashed into your life. Here is Pastor John Jordan with today's message. So we're going to embark on some exciting things starting today, and that's the expositional journey through the book of Ephesians. We will go through this entire letter one verse at a time, and it will take many, 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 many months, maybe. One theologian said of Ephesians that it is just pure music to read it. Many people throughout time have given it nicknames, preachers of the past. They've called it the Christian's checkbook, the treasure house of the Bible, the divinest composition that man has ever made, the queen of the epistles, the grand canyon of scripture. I like that one. And the last is the believer's bank. The believer's bank. And when I say that word bank, my mind runs to my bank and it's U.S. bank. It's right over there. And you might think about your bank as I start speaking about banks, and you have a bank account, and there may be a lot of money or a little bit of money or maybe no money at all in it. And many of us have checking accounts and savings accounts and money market accounts. And if you had a financial meltdown happen in the United States, we're okay with that because we have FDIC insurance and up to $250,000, which I don't have that much, so I'm good. But anyone that had over 250000 if that happened, a financial collapse happened, that would be lost past that number, right? And maybe you had a parent that died, or maybe you had a parent that handed you their house in the will, and you sold that house, or maybe the grandparents handed you money, or maybe you're later on in life and you've saved and saved and saved, and you have over that amount, but if a financial meltdown happened, you would lose anything past the $250,000 mark. And the bank's calling right now. (laughs) I'm glad that happened to Pastor McNeff and not me. (laughs) But think about this. You know, we joke around with this because we don't have that much money, so it's not a problem. But if a meltdown got widespread enough, if a collapse got more across the world and into the United States, the government's ability to pay back everyone's loss at $250,000 Do you really think that could be fulfilled? Meaning the security that you have, that bank account that you look at, that screen that you pop up on your phone to see how you're doing, that nest egg, that security blanket, that money could be lost. Then your hope is lost. Some of us were not around in 1920s. In 1930s, at the beginning, and there was called the Great Depression. You've probably read about it. There was a Great Depression. It went all across the world, not just the United States, but the United States stock market collapsed in 1929 on October 24th. It's called Black Thursday. And back then, there was no FDIC insurance, so if a family had whatever they had in the bank, it was in danger. Whatever they had in the bank was in jeopardy. And when the Depression first hit, you know what the banks did? They locked down withdrawal limits. You, Mr. Jordan, can only take out 10% of the max, that's all you can take out of the bank, of what you've put into the bank. Can you imagine going up to the counter? Sorry, Mr. Jordan, I know that your bank balance is $13,000, but you may withdraw $1,300, that's it. But that's what happened. And then pretty soon they could withdraw nothing. And banks simply didn't have enough reserves to cover the, the deposits. And my question to us as we jump into this book is, do you think that could ever happen again? Do you think the government is your savior? Do you think that if you just put your faith in Wells Fargo or some banking institution that you're going to be okay? I think back to growing up, and my grandfather lived through the Depression. He was a kid, and he said his family lost everything they had in the bank. And there was no government check coming. There was no check in the mail, no no bailout money. And so you know what he did his whole life? He kept his money between the mattress and the box spring in his bedroom. He would actually cash my paycheck if I couldn't get to the bank before it closed. He would take my check and give me some cash, and I would 
take care of it later. And I, he didn't trust the banks. Why? His family lost everything. And he thought, it's safer, I have more faith to place it underneath the American Serta mattress than to put it in the Bank of America. But see, however, this is the case with the world, but this is not the case with our God. His kingdom assets are without end. His heavenly depository has no restrictions on the Christian's withdrawals. In fact, Christ is, and those that are in Christ, is far beyond adequate to cover all past debts, all of them, and all of today's present liabilities, and all of your future needs forever. And without diminishing his heavenly reserves, it's not like he's going to run out. It never goes down. It never is diminished. And the beauty of this letter of the Ephesians is in your Bible for a reason, to show us the richness that we have in Christ, to show us the blessedness that we have in Christ. And let me just give you a sampling from the letter. Paul speaks of the Christian's wealth. Chapter 1, verse 7, he says, The riches are his grace, God's grace. Chapter 3, verse 8 says, The unfathomable riches of Christ. Chapter 3, 16 says, The riches of His glory. Chapter 3, 19, You're filled up with the fullness of God. Chapter 4, 13, We're filled up with the fullness of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 18, You're filled up with the fullness of the Spirit. The fullness of His grace, the riches in Christ, the fullness of His glory. And then it says, Fullness of God, that's the Father. Fullness of Christ, that's the Son. Fullness of Spirit, there's a trinity right there. So it's an amazing book. And I'll, I'll just give you some stats of just important grammar. You know, we care about words. Words matter. And words in the Bible matter because it shows the truth of, the, of, the, of the, what the Scripture is trying to tell you, that the God intended to tell you. But here's a few stats. The word riches is used five times in the letter. Grace is used 12 times. Glory is used eight times. Fullness filled up or filled six times. The phrase in Christ or the equivalent 36 times in this one letter. John MacArthur said, Christ is the source, and Christ is the sphere, and Christ is the guarantee of every spiritual blessing, and all those spiritual riches, and all that blessing, he says, is those that are in him have access to that, and that's Christians. And not only do they get access to riches, they get access to all that Christ is, and all that Christ has, and he has everything. So in Christ, God makes us, believers, fellow heirs to Christ, Romans 8, 17. And we will share with each other all that he possesses. An inheritance, you, you might be out of your will of your parents, I don't know. But we have an inheritance coming. And this inheritance, it says in 1 Peter 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 4, that an inheritance is imperishable, it's undefiled, it will not fade away, it's reserved in heaven and in Christ, believers are truly blessed with every spiritual blessing. And it's so amazing that you can't think about this book and not call for celebration in your heart, in your mind as you approach this text. But I would be remiss to not tell you that conversely, if you're not in Christ, if Christ is not who you claim to be in, then Ephesians 2.12 is true for you. And that says you're separate from Christ. If you're not in Christ, then you're separate from him. And you're excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. We're all grafted in as, as Greek or Gentiles grafted into the vine. But they're, we're strangers now to the covenant promises of the Bible, it says in Ephesians 2.12, because you are separate from Christ. You're not in Christ. So then he ends it by saying you have no hope. You have no hope if you don't have Christ. You're just without God in the world. You're just tripping along on the earth in your life. So for the Christian, and most of us are Christians that are here, we, we just with a little understanding of the riches of this book need to approach this bank account that we have in heaven and understand that gives us security and it gives us value and it gives us hope and it gives you contentment and joy despite your life circumstances. Let's just read the opening verses together. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, introductory remarks. We should be done in about five, ten minutes. No. <laughs> Ephesians 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, 
and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's an amazing interest to a letter. We don't write letters like that. Well, let me just give you an overview of the book, an overview of the letter, an overview of Ephesians, so we're all on the same page as we launch into this. It was written sometimes between 60 to 62 AD. Paul wrote this from prison in Rome, and he wrote it to churches he had pastored. And the backdrop is that there are Christians beginning to form this church, this body of Christ, like we are forming this small church here. And Ephesians is going to focus on that church, what they need to do with the basic doctrine of what God wants them to know and how it is that he wants them to live and how it is that he wants them to function within the body of Christ. And, and he also is revealing a, mis a mystery in here. Paul was to show God's mystery of, chapter 3, verse 3, tells us that this mystery is that there are Jews and Gentiles part of this church. Verse 4 of chapter 3, Paul says, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. You're going to get it, which in other generations have not been made known to the sons of men. They did not get it. And now it's been revealed to the holy apostles, which he is one of them, and the prophets in the Spirit. And then he says, here's the, mystery. here's the mystery. It's been hidden from Israel, even though they were God's chosen people. It's hidden from them, verse 6 of chapter 3, that Gentiles, non-Jewish people, are fellow heirs of the promise with the chosen nation. And right now, we're doing an audio Bible. So we understand that we're partakers of this promise, both Jew and Gentile. We're not excluded from the promise, and they don't automatically get it for the birthright, but we are all part of this promise in Christ through the gospel. So this is amazing for us because I'm not a Jewish, and you had no hope if you're not engrafted in, right? And we understand that he wrote this letter to them, and in this letter he's going to show the riches that they have, which we have, all those who are in Christ have these riches. And then he's going to say, Jew and Gentile are part of that, which we are, which is an amazing truth in itself. And then he's going to say, here's the truth I want you to know, verses, chapters 1 through 3, rather. And then here's how I want you to live as a church in chapters 4 through 6. It's amazing. It's amazing. The first three chapters are theological. The first three chapters emphasize New Testament doctrine. And then the last three chapters are practical, how to live. It's kind of like when we talked about Romans last week. Chapters 1 through 11 is doctrine. Chapters 12 through 16 is practical Christian living. I actually call this Romans Jr. That's how I refer to Ephesians. So despite that, though, he ends with some amazing thing, too. We know we're going to have trouble in this life, right? We know Satan's going to attack us, especially if we try and run to Christ. And we know our own self-satisfaction comes in the way. We know our own complacency comes in the way. So the last chapter of Ephesians is the spiritual armor of God. The sufficiency of this spiritual armor is supplied through the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, chapter 6, 10 through 17. And then it ends with, you need prayer. It ends with 6, verse 18. You need vigilant and persistent prayer. So let us look to the opening verses and break them down a little bit to reflect on the powerful letter that Paul is starting to pin and realize that the blessings that happen there are for us. Number one in your outline is the apostle was blessed. The apostle himself was blessed. Verse 1a. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So we're just going to stop right there. Paul's original name was what? Saul. Saul. And Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And he probably was named after King Saul, who was the most prominent Benjamite, the first king of Israel. And Saul was an educated man. And he had spoke about this this morning, Pastor McNeff did in Sunday school. He was trained. He was trained in what we would call humanities. He knew a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff, but probably was really extensively training in rabbinical studies under the famous uh, Gamaliel in Acts 22.3. And he became an outstanding student. He became a rabbi of rabbis. He rose even above Gamaliel in his own right. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a ruling Jewish council member in Jerusalem. And he also became a really, really bad guy to the church. He was an ardent, 
anti-Christian leader, most of all Judaism. So he passionately hated you, and he hated Christ, and he hated anyone connected to Christ. Saul did. And he wanted to crush it. And he was on his way to Damascus to crush some Christians over there. And on the way, Jesus Christ reached in, pulled him back, and miraculously and dramatically stopped him in his tracks and brought him to salvation, brought him to himself. No free will on Paul's part, brought by the Lord in Acts 9, 1 through 8. And after spending three years, he was brought to the Lord and then three years out in the desert of Arabia, joining pastors with other people in Antioch and Syria, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean. And during those years, during that early ministry of Paul, when God is pouring into him, he became to be known as Paul, Acts 13, 9. We, we mentioned this before, you have a new man takes on a new name. And he's from Antioch, and the Holy Spirit then sends him out from Antioch with Barnabas to begin the greatest missionary enterprise in the history of the church, starting churches wherever they went. And at this point, Paul began his work as God's unique apostle. What was, what was his position in Christ? What was he supposed to go do? We're thankful he was supposed to go to the Gentiles. His ministry was to the Gentiles. That's us. And imagine this, Paul, an apostle of Christ. What a blessing to be bestowed on a former Christ hater. He's a former church destroyer. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 13. Galatians 1 verse 13, Paul says, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute what? The church, the church of God, beyond measure, tried to do what? Destroy that church. Verse 14, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, even his future teacher and my countrymen, and I was extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. So his traditions fueled him, and this man, Saul, was certainly blessed by God to be in Christ and now be made an apostle after he tried to kill Christians, crush Christ's church. So you talk about his bank account. What, what do you think Paul's bank account looks like, spiritually speaking? He's a Christ hater turned apostle? What a blessing. And you're saying, well, what about all of us? We're Christians. Isn't it similar to us? You're like, no, I'm not an apostle. There are apostles today, but we were all God-haters. We were all God-haters. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says this, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit of God set their things on the Spirit. For the mind that's set on the flesh is death, but the mind that is set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. We hate God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, nor is it even able to do so. And those who are of the flesh, who aren't in Christ and underneath God, cannot please God. So you're hostile to God, you're at war with God, you can't please God, and you are by nature children of wrath. That's what Ephesians 2 says. God's righteous anger towards mankind's sinfulness is perfectly in aligning with his glorious, perfect, justified, righteous self. And Paul is now, was Saul, now he's called Paul, and he went from chief opponent to the main one God's using. He wrote over half the New Testament. That's amazing. But we're connected to him in that sense that we hated God too, and God chose to save us. We don't think about this, and some of you may have never read about Paul when he was Saul, but if you turn with me to Acts 7, I just want to get you a sense. This is not just, oh, he put some bad posts on his social media about Jesus. He, he didn't like churches, so he, you know, put bad things on their Yelp review or whatever. <laughs> Acts chapter 7, verse 58, this gives you a sense of what kind of man Saul was that Jesus saved. In verse 58, it says, When they had driven him, that Stephen, out of the city, Stephen was the first martyr for the faith of the new church. When they driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, not to hurt him, to kill him. And the witnesses laid aside all their robes at the feet of a young man named 
Saul. That's Paul right there. And verse 59 says, Those men went on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then jump to chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was hearty. He was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. He was excited almost probably as Stephen was dying. So, so when I say it's no small thing for this same man, Saul, to be called Paul, he is guilty before the Lord, he's after the Lord, he's after his church, and Paul's now saying, I'm Paul, I used to be Saul, and I'm an apostle of Jesus now. By the will of God. So I want you to think about your own life. You're a hater of God. No, you're not an apostle of God, but you're a hater of God. So it's no small thing. You were formerly sons of disobedience. You were formerly underneath the sway of the evil one, Satan. And now you're called a saint of God. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ to the kingdom of God. There's many of us who are blessed here today. And you might be thinking of your life and your own bank account saying, well, I'm not that blessed. No, you are blessed. Because he reached in, in the middle of the mire, and pulled you out and set you on the rock by the will of God. And even though these first couple of little phrases here don't have the word blessed in it, and my title was, The Apostle is Blessed, because blessing is all over this section. It's all over the beginning of the book, and it's all over the book itself. And I added verse 3 for that purpose. Verse 3 says, We're blessed be God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. The us includes Paul. The us includes the ones he's writing to. And it includes all of us with every spiritual blessing. And I just need to make a brief aside about this because I want you to elaborate on the term. Words have meanings, and the meanings of blessing and blessed in this passage have a different meaning that you might not think of. When you hear the English word blessed or blessing, your mind might run to, I don't know, Sermon on the Mount. And you might say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes at the beginning, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so this is the same as that. However, the original word used in Ephesians 1 is not the same word used in Ephesians 5. I mean, Matthew 5. So Matthew 5 and Ephesians 1 have the word blessed in our English language, but two different words in the original. So the Greek word for blessing or blessed found in the Beatitudes, when Jesus was saying that, is makarios. Makarios carries the idea of being satisfied, being happy, having joy. It's subjective. It's experiential happiness. It's contentment, the satisfaction from something coming from the outside that's subjective. But the other word that Paul uses here for blessing in Ephesians 1 is eulogeo. Like we get the word eulogy from that. Eulogeo, which is the word used that Paul chose to use, that says it carries the idea to make someone worthy. Paul is blessed. He was made worthy. He was endowed with an ability by someone. That's Christ. By someone, that's God. So this is objective. This is not subjective. It's objective. And it tells you of the magnitude, it tells you of what kind of blessing he received from God. God blesses all of us too, and he blessed Paul then, and we become blessed. Eulogeo. And the Father is blessing Paul with all these blessings from heaven and overwhelming this sinner, this man who tried to stomp out the church. And, and it's the same for all of us today. Paul is blessed with such a blessing, he's appointed by the sheer will of God to be an apostle. And we're like, okay, so what, John? He's an apostle. Well, the original term for apostle is apostolos. And apostolos means one sent. He didn't raise to the rank. He didn't earn something. He was sent by someone, not his own authority, not Paul, not his power, not his will. God ordained him to do that. God called him to do that. And so we see Paul really writing almost like a song. And our song is the same as his. In Christ, all of us who are believers, every one of us has been delivered from our sin, delivered from our former self, the old man, and that one that was underneath the sway of Satan. And we're given a new position in Christ. We're given a new purpose in Christ. We're given new authority in him and from him. And so you can't read this and not get excited and celebrate because it's something to celebrate, isn't it? Paul should have went to hell for all eternity for what he did to Christ and to the church. And God showed him grace and put him in the proper side of the equation of what he wanted him to do. 
So, so I look around at you guys, and I thought about for this myself. Have you ever considered your position in Christ, really? We always get wrapped up in this world and what we live in and what our lives look like. But have you ever considered the position that you really have in Christ? When God the Father looks at you, he doesn't see you. He doesn't see all your inconsistencies and all your sinful habits and all the stuff that you have in your life, the baggage that you bring. He sees his son perfectly covering you. And he can accept you. Thank you for joining us today for Unleashing the Truth, the broadcast ministry of Christ Church of the Valley in Vacaville. You can hear Unleashing the Truth each Sunday at 9.30 a.m., If you're in the Vacaville area, you can visit Christ Church of the Valley and hear Pastor John Jordan live. Find out more at ChristCV.org. We hope you join us next week for Unleashing the Truth.